This is Under Review, the show that talks about Colorado sports with a sprinkling of national sports stories as well. I'm Jordan Long. The Colorado Rockies pitchers and catchers will report to spring training on February 14th. The rest of the team will be there on February 19th. Now Colorado will play their first spring training game against Arizona on February 25th. Of course, last year, the Rockies were very, very disappointing. They finished with a record of 68 wins and 94 losses. If you go back to last offseason, the Rockies thought they had the next face of the franchise when they agreed to a contract with Chris Bryant. Bryant signed a seven-year, $182 million deal with the Rockies. If you divide that, that's $27 million a year. The Rockies thought they had made a splash. Usually the Rockies stay away from these splashes, but they thought they did with Chris Bryant. Well, unfortunately, it did not work out. Bryant on offense had just 160 at-bats. That's the lowest amount of at-bats in his career for a full Major League Baseball season. He was still able to collect five home runs and 14 RBIs. Bryant also played in left field for 30 games and he was designated hitter for 12, a total of 42 games. If you divide that, that's only 26% of the season. Really not what the Rockies thought they would have. Basically, it was a lost season. Now, Brian missed most of the season, dealing with plantar fasciitis and a bone bruise in his foot. So really, he spent the time on the injured list, or really, he didn't get to play because of these injuries, and that's not good for the Rockies. So basically, these injuries did not help. The Rockies definitely missed his presence on the field. Looking at this season, Chris Bryant is expected to be 100%. You know, if you think about it, that's great on paper. At least he can play in spring training games to prepare for the Major League Baseball season. I get it. That's a great step, but that's only a starting point. I get Bryant needs to play in spring training games to be ready for the season. Spring training, though, is a great start, but the regular season is what means more and what matters. The Rockies need him to be 100%. The good news is, though, he is not experiencing setbacks, which is good to this point. Now, manager Bud Black, who is the manager of the Colorado Rockies, said this, quote, Encouraged that he'll be exactly where he needs to be a month from now. End quote. I like what Bud Black is saying, but the truth is, we don't know how Bryant is going to react to the regular season. I know injuries happen, but Bryant must prove he is healthy. The Rockies need his presence on the field. 162 games, you know, is a grind, and I get that. But if Bryant can play 120 or more, that'd be great for the Colorado Rockies another year where he's on the injured list or basically can't play. And that is also injured reserve that will not help the Colorado Rockies. It would also be a wonder why they signed him to a long-term contract. They want to be an approved team and really Chris Bryant is a key to that, but we will have to wait and see if and when he is healthy. He says he is healthy, but will he be healthy is the big question because 162 games is a grind. Now I will have a Colorado Rockies preview before the season start starts, before the season starts, so be sure to look for that in March. Now moving on to the NCAA. It came as no surprise that Jim Harbaugh decided to stay at the University of Michigan. There are rumors that if an NFL job came about, he would jump to the NFL. Well, he was an NFL head coach in the past with the San Francisco 49ers. Now, it lasted from 2011 to 2014. Now, he's pretty good with the Niners. His mark was 44 wins, 19 losses, and one tie. A winning percentage of .695. He took the 49ers to the playoffs three out of those four years. Of course, they went to the Super Bowl. Super Bowl 47, but lost to the Baltimore Ravens 34-31. Now, I did not agree with the firing, but it came as a surprise that the 49ers fired him 
following an eight and eight mark in 2014. Now I look at that and eight and eight is not that bad. I don't understand why the 49ers were so quick to fire him at eight and eight. 500 record is pretty good in the NFL. It's not like he had a losing season when he was the head coach of the 49ers. Anyway, the 49ers let him go and actually he found his dream job, dream job at the University of Michigan. He has been with the University of Michigan as head coach since 2015. Now, Harbaugh has been very successful with the school. His overall record stands at an impressive 74 wins and 25 losses, a winning percentage of .747. Now, if you really look at that success, you would say, oh, that's very successful. Unfortunately, it hasn't been a success in bowl games where he is 1-6. and six. The NFL sounded good. Now, Denver and Carolina interviewed him. I even thought that um, the Broncos were actually one of the favorites to land him. Now, it was more to see if they could lure him, that is Carolina and Denver, could lure him away from the University of Michigan. Both the Broncos and Panthers have owners who can basically put a blank check in front of any candidate. The Broncos, of course, have the Walton Penner Group as their head coach, or excuse me, as their owners. Now, if you look at the Walt, Walton Penner Group, basically the Broncos have the richest owners in the NFL. That's why they're trying to go after Sean Payton and pay him whatever he wants. But that is a story for another day. Now, as for both the Broncos and the Panthers, they can basically say how much money it will take for a candidate to land there as their head coach. For Jim Harbaugh, though, I really didn't see him going anywhere. But I'm not sure that the Panthers had that much interest. It was more just to see what the interest was from Jim Harbaugh. They just wanted to talk to him and see what could happen. I can't say the same for the Denver Broncos. The Broncos had Harbaugh as one of their top candidates for their head coaching vacancy. In the end, though, I think Harbaugh actually made the right decision and decided to go back to the University of Michigan. Now, it doesn't surprise me that he's going to stay at the University of Michigan. He has been very, very successful there. The man can recruit, and they will be a top team in the Big Ten Conference as well as the NCAA, as we saw last year, because they got into the college football playoff. Sure, they lost before in the semifinals, but hey, at least you've got them there. He has a little bit of unfinished business at the University of Michigan. The University of Michigan has not won a national title in football since 1997. He wants to win one there, and I don't blame him. It would be an amazing story for Jim Harbaugh to win one, and basically he also played for that school. So it's pretty amazing if he were to win a national title for the school he actually played for and its coaching. It actually showed me that, you know, you want to be there, but you just can't pay me to just leave. I get it. Harbaugh knows that in the University of Michigan is where he wants to stay, but he wanted to see what the interest was in the NFL. And basically, it basically said that it showed me that they can pay him the amount, but he doesn't want to leave. Any blank check wouldn't have mattered. But if you look at it, it also gave him leverage with the University of Michigan to say, hey, you can pay me anything because I can go out and get these jobs. But again, he just stayed there. But he has a dream job, and I know he wants more money, but why would you leave? I get the NFL is tempting since it's the top level of football. There are 32 jobs in the NFL you want one of those 32 jobs as your dream job. In the end, though, this may not be Harbaugh's last chance to be an NFL coach. Hear me out. We know that every year coaches get fired. I don't think he really liked the jobs that are out there. If Carolina and Denver were the top jobs, it just didn't seem like he wanted those jobs. As for Jim Harbaugh, it will depend on what he feels like is the best situation for him. 
Could I see him going back to the NFL? I mean, yes, I could because you want to win a Super Bowl ring, but of course you want to take the University of Michigan to a national title. That would be pretty special. He knows he's going to have a top, I'm going to say 25 recruiting recruiting class every year at the University of Michigan. Plus, you're going to be in the fold to win the Big Ten Conference. If you win the Big Ten Conference, that gives you a chance to win a national title. I just don't see him leaving the University of Michigan anytime soon. But of course, I could be completely wrong because if you look at the next couple of years, who knows what coaches are going to be fired. If coaches are fired, that will tell Harbaugh, hey, you know what? Maybe I want this situation. I really thought Denver was the best situation because you had a quarterback in Russell Wilson. Not many teams have a veteran quarterback. So I figured, you know what you brought? If you bring Harbaugh in and you team him up with Russell Wilson, that would have been perfect. Unfortunately, I get it from Jim Harbaugh's perspective that he did not want to come to Denver. He wanted to stay at the University of Michigan. It just feels like Jim Harbaugh may not leave the college game since he's doing so well. I get it, though. If he wins a national title, though, that may be a different story. Like I said, you want to be number one. You want to win a national title. If he does that at the University of Michigan, then maybe he may want another crack at the NFL because you want to take a team and turn the team around to become Super Bowl champions. But of course, that may not happen. For now, though, I get why Jim Harbaugh is staying at the University of Michigan. He wants to win a Big Ten title. And of course, the next step is to win a national title. So I get it. So he has made the best choice for him. And hopefully he will take Michigan to the promised land. On to the NBA with the MVP race. It's heating up. There are a few candidates to consider. Luka, Luka Doncic, Jason Tatum, Giannis Antetokounmpo, really hard to say because he is Greek, and Joel Embiid. Right now, the betting favorite to win the award is Nikola Jokic. Of course, it doesn't matter what the odds say. Sure, it's great that Vegas thinks Jokic is the MVP, but let's face it. Face it. Vegas is not always right. To me, it shouldn't be a question of who the MVP is right now. It is Nikola Jokic. I know I am a Nuggets fan. Of course, you know that I am a Nuggets fan because I follow all Colorado sports. But I'm not trying to be biased here. That is not the reason why he should be the MVP of the regular season. Let's take a look at his body of work so far this season. He has been the back-to-back MVP. I know Jokic is points per game are down from last year. In fact, he averaged 27.1 points per game last year. It's at 25.1 points per game. Really, that's two points difference. Not a big deal. The truth is, Jokic doesn't have to be the only player on the Denver Nuggets scoring this year. He has a healthy Michael Porter Jr. and Jamal Murray. That helps. Jokic can play his game, which is to score, rebound, and find his teammates for assists. Of course, he just passed the great Alex English for most assists in Denver Nuggets history. He doesn't have to do it all like he did last year. Now, if we go back to points per game, the MVP should be Luka Doncic. Doncic averages a league high 33.7 points per game. Jokic, if you are wondering, his points are 16th in the league. When it comes to rebounding, Jokic grabs 11 rebounds per game, which is 6th in the league. It is very rare for a center to be able to pass the ball around. Usually they are down low in the key to rebound and put up points. Not Jokic. He knows he's not the only scorer, but looks to get his teammates involved on offense. He totals 9.9 assists per game, second in the league. Jokic puts up 25.1 points, 11 rebounds, and 9.9 assists per game. That is almost a triple-double Every time he steps out on the court, looking at his double doubles, he has 32, which is second only to Sabonis, who has 33. As for triple doubles, and this is why he should be the MVP, he has 14 right now. 
that leads the league. The Nuggets are one of the best teams in the league because of Jokic's play. The MVP should go to the player who is most valuable for his team to his team, and that is Jokic. Sure, he is Michael Porter Jr., Jamal Murray, and Aaron Gordon helping him. The thing is, though, Jokic is putting up a triple-double or double-doubles every single night. There aren't many players who can say that. Right now, the Nuggets are 32-13. and 13. 32 wins and 13 losses, first in the Western Conference. You take Jokic off of this team, they are the seventh seed. So right now, with Jokic, they are the first seed in the Western Conference. You take them off. They may be the seventh through eight, or excuse me, seventh through tenth seed. That would be only good enough to get a play in game, play in tournament game. There is still a lot of basketball left to be played. The Nuggets have 37 games left in the season. If Jokic can maintain his pace, it would be very hard for the NBA not to give him the MVP. The problem is, though, the NBA doesn't normally like to give out the MVP. M- BP award to the same player each year. The NBA hasn't given out the NBA MVP award to the same player three years in a row since Larry Bird. And that was from 1984 to 1986. Besides Jokic, Jokic going for three, the last player who won two in a row is Giannis Antetokounmpo. He won it before Jokic did in 2019 and 2020. The NBA will have a tough time not giving the MVP to Jokic. Of course, there's still a lot of basketball left to be played in the NBA's regular season. Even if Jokic doesn't win the MVP, that is not his goal. He wants to lead the Denver Nuggets to the NBA championship. Sure, the MVP would be great, but that's an individual award. For Jokic, helping his teammates night in, night out is what matters to him. He doesn't care about individual stuff. A championship would solidify him as one of the best players to ever play the NBA game, especially as one of the best centers to ever play. He is on his way to becoming the best Nuggets player to ever play for the franchise. Of course, I thought it was Alex English, but Jokic is going to surpass him. Hopefully, Jokic is named MVP, But the playoffs are what matter. But either way, though, Jokic has a great chance of being the MVP again. We're going to move on. And finally, to my NFL picks of the week. Of course, last week was the super wild card round. This week is the divisional matchups. We will actually start in the AFC with the top seeded Kansas City Chiefs hosting the Jacksonville Jaguars. Of course, Kansas City got a buy into the divisional round and they are a nine-point favorite. Kansas City, the thing about them is they are great at home field advantage. Looking at Jacksonville, Jacksonville beat the Chargers in the wild card round. If you look at Jacksonville, they need to run the ball with Travis Etienne, and that will help them control the clock. That is key because you can't have three and outs and put the Kansas City offense back on the field. Jacksonville, though, must have a better start. If you go back to last week, they were down 27 to nothing against the LA Chargers and came back to win 31 to 30. You cannot put yourself in a big hole and you can't start slow on offense. Looking at Kansas City, that offense is dangerous. Patrick Mahomes is one of the most difficult quarterbacks to bring down. He can run with the football and find his open receivers. Jacksonville must spy him. If not, it could be a long game because if you don't spy him, Patrick Mahomes can actually run around in the pocket and run for first downs. The thing is, though, Kansas City is too good at Arrowhead Stadium as they keep their season going. The Cincinnati Bengals versus the Buffalo Bills. The Bills are five-and-a-half-point favorites. The Bills' key to success on offense is to establish the passing game. Josh Allen is a smart quarterback who won't force the ball downfield into coverage. He can also run the football. He has one main target, and that is Stephon Diggs. The Bengals must take that away and force Allen to throw to someone else. The Bengals know the passing game is what they have to stop. The Bills don't really have a threat of a running game. Even so, 
the Bengals defense needs to find a way to stop Josh Allen and force turnovers. For the Bengals, they have a great quarterback too in Joe Burrow, and he doesn't turn the ball over that much. The thing that helps him is the running game of Joe Mixon. Mixon runs the football, and that takes the pressure off of the passing game. When the Bengals do pass it, Burrow has three receivers he can trust. Jamar Chase, Tyler Boyd, and T. Higgins. The Bills know they have to cover all of them. Now, if you look at this game, though, it's going to be a tight game. Third downs may actually end up may actually end up helping a team win, but don't be surprised if these teams go on fourth down. It's going to be a close game, and I know the Bills are tough at home, but I have the Cincinnati Bengals. On to the NFC, the New York football Giants versus the Philadelphia Eagles. Philadelphia is a seven and a half point favorite. The Eagles, they know how tough they are to stop on offense. They really use their running game, but quarterback Jalen Hurts can also throw the football as well. That makes them hard to beat. Running the football will control the clock for the Philadelphia Eagles. As for the Giants defense, as we know, this is a divisional game, really in the playoffs, so they know this team well. They have to slow the running game on defense. On offense, it's really on the arm of Daniel Jones. He must be accurate and find his open man. Looking at this game, though, it's going to be close because both teams know each other extremely well. But it's really hard to pick against the Philadelphia Eagles as they get the victory. The 49ers hosting the Dallas Cowboys. And if you really look at this game, the 49ers are a four-point favorite. For the 49ers, their quarterback is Brock Purdy. He has not looked like a rookie quarterback. Purdy is finding his open receivers and not turning the ball over. That has to be the case this week and find Debo Samuel early and often, and that will help him get into a rhythm on offense. Another player he has to find is tight end George Kittle. He may be a nightmare matchup for the Cowboys. The reason is he can beat the defense with his speed. Christian McCaffrey must also be able to run the football and catch passes out of the backfield. If he runs the football well, that will open up the passing game for Purdy. When it comes to the defense of the Cowboys, pressure Purdy. Doing that will make him feel uncomfortable in the pocket, which could force Purdy to throw the football sooner than he wants to, which could be picked or hold on to the football, which will be sacks. As for the Dallas Cowboys offense, we know how dangerous they can be. Basically, they have Dak Prescott, who can throw the football and run it as well. That will keep the 49ers defense guessing. The Cowboys also have a great tandem. If you're running the football of Tony Pollard and Ezekiel Elliott, that will open up the passing game. I think this is going to be a tight game, but I have to go with the San Francisco 49ers. My picks again, the Jacksonville Jaguars versus the Kansas City Chiefs, Kansas City, Bengals versus Bills. I'm going the upset, the Bengals. New York Giants versus the Philadelphia Eagles. Fly, Eagles, fly. Dallas versus San Francisco. San Francisco. I'm Jordan Long. This has been Under Review. Read my blog that I write Mondays through Thursdays with podcasts on Fridays at sports-scoop.com. Subscribe to the Sideline Sports Network on YouTube so you don't miss any of our great shows that we have every single day. Please subscribe so you don't miss any of them. This has been a Sideline Sports production.